you may be seated. How are we doing, church? I'm very good, very good. I love the 1130. Yeah, so, yeah, so fun. Hey, uh, I just want to say thank you. You know, last week uh, I kicked off uh, this campaign to feed 100,000 um, people or to prepare 100,000 meals to give to people who need to be fed, which is, is a really awesome thing. And, and I just want to thank you as a church for the way that you responded. In, in just uh, like six short days, uh, 500 and some people have signed up. And, and so I just want to say thank you. Way to go, church, for showing up. Now... The truth is we, we need some more people to sh- sign up, right? And, and so I just, I just don't want you to miss out on what God is up to. You know, this year we really uh, wanted to be intentional by making an impact beyond the four walls, outside of the four walls, not just to the ends of the earth, which this is a to the ends of the earth, but regionally and locally. And so I'm excited to, to tell you more as we kind of shape those in the coming months. But right now, um, as we just prepare our hearts, right, to, to prepare for that, I just want to make sure we understand the why. And this video really helps me understand the why we're doing 100,000 meals. So I ask that you take a look at this. What difference does a meal make? A meal means everything to someone whose community is experiencing a famine. Someone whose family is living in a refugee camp or someone who's struggling to make ends meet. The meals you pack empower students to grow in knowledge. The meals you pack support moms and dads as they provide for their family. The meals you pack give stability to families who live in uncertainty. A meal sparks hope for a better future. A meal makes a difference for a child, a family, a community. And when a healthy meal is given in Jesus' name, that can change everything. You know, I, I love uh, what Jesus said in the New Testament. He said that if you take care of the least of these, then you took care of me. And the full circle moment, just to give you a little spoiler of where we're going with this lifeline partnership, is uh, someday, hopefully someday soon, I would love to also participate in the mission trips over the summer that go and deliver the food that we packed. So that, again, as families, we get to not only prepare the resource, but then give the resource. So be looking forward to that. But I'd love for you to still join us. There's plenty of time. It's going to be a special day. And so if you haven't signed up, please do. All right. You guys ready to jump back into our series? Welcome to the jungle. Very good. Very good. Uh, Thank you to everyone who helped us kick that off last week. If you are new or you're just joining us, or you're just tuning in, we are doing a series called Welcome to the Jungle. And we're looking at the story of creation. And so last week we did kind of Genesis chapter one. And today we're going to be camped out in Genesis chapter two. So if you have your Bible, it's really cool. You just turn your cover and you're there (laughs) and go to number two. (laughs) It's the first book of the Bible. And if you missed anything, I would encourage you. I don't really have time to recap because we covered a lot last week. Uh, Make sure you go watch that. And if you haven't, check out the podcast. We kind of do a deeper dive on that. And I know someone asked uh, me, is the podcast a one-time thing? And so for me, I'm going to tell you, no, we're going to do it uh, for the rest of this series, all next series. And and then we're going to take a break, I think, at Christmas and then bring it back in January. It's just really fun. And there's always a lot of content. So it's really easy to to prepare for. So you can kind of bank on that. All right. All right. So we're in Genesis chapter two. And how we kind of started last week is we asked three questions. So whenever we approach a scripture, there's three questions we have to approach with to best understand what it is that God has for us even today. And those questions was who wrote it, when did they write it, and why did they write it? And and so who is is really key detail because it helps inform the when and the when helps inform the why. So let's go before any further. Who wrote the book of Genesis? We believe, archaeologists believe, theologians believe that it was written by Moses. Uh, That's awesome. Uh, But when did Moses write it? Well, great question. Moses wrote the book of Genesis during the Exodus when they were 40 years in the wilderness. Why does that matter? Well, it matters because 
For 400 years, God's people were enslaved. Uh, Generations where people were enslaved in Egypt. And the why, because when you understand who and when, it informs the why. The why that he wrote it is because for 400 years, they had sojourned in Egypt and they knew more about Egyptian worship and Egyptian culture than the God, Yahweh, and his purpose and plan for them. And this is really what it has to do with us because the same creator Yahweh that had a purpose and a plan for the Israelites is the same creator God that I believe has a purpose and a plan for us. And so we understand his purpose and plan for them. It better informs us of God's purpose and plan for us because wherever there is purpose, there is a plan. Amen? Amen. So today we're looking at Genesis 2, and I think we're going to unpack the why. Uh, Why did Moses inform the Israelites of this? So what I want to do is I just want to read through the chapter at face value, meaning we're we're not going to get into the why, and we're just going to read it because I think there's a lot in there. And then at the end, we'll kind of close out with the why. All right, you guys ready? Two people are ready. It's going to be a long service, y'all. Come on, somebody. All right, very good. Well, let's jump into it. Let's jump into it. So let's pick up in Genesis chapter two. We're gonna start in verse four and then kind of move in from there. All right, this is what it says. It's on the screen if you wanna follow along. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, neither wild plants nor grains were growing on the earth. For the Lord God had not sent rain to water the earth and there were no people to cultivate the soil. Now there's a lot just in those first two verses, okay? The first thing is this, and this is, this is just maybe a Holy Spirit prompted thing. Uh, I think it's amazing that God uh, said in Genesis 1 last week that he, right, he separated and expanded, right? And then he named it and, and then he filled it with stuff. And what's crazy is this is not a deviation from that story. It's a declaration of how he fills. He plants things, and why, why is that important? It's because I think some of you in this room right now, you have been praying, you have been begging, you have been pleading the blood of God on maybe a prodigal or a situation in your life that you're God, needing God to intervene in. And I just want to tell you what Genesis tells us is that God planted it and his season is more important than our season. And so what, what God needs and what, of you is to just trust his timing because it's perfect. So you've been praying about something. Don't wonder if God's working. Trust that he's planted and he's always working before the surface, before it breaks through to what we can see. The second thing that this informs us of is that we serve a creator, right? What Moses is informing the Israelites is there's a creator who has a purpose and a plan for us. And his purpose is to partner with us, right? It says nothing had sprouted because there were no people to cultivate the soil, which means that he needed us to help play a part in what he was doing. Not because he's not good, but because he wants to partner with us. That's the goodness of our God. All right, move on to verse number six. It says this, instead springs came up from the ground and watered all the land. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of the man or life into the man's nostrils and the man became a living being. Now again, this is another powerful statement. First is we discover where the world's first underground irrigation system came from. Any landscapers in here? This is where it started. In the garden. Three people thought that was funny. Okay. <laughs> I thought it was funny. The second thing is, is, is I, again, this is kind of a crux verse of the whole story. And so if you're the underlining type, the highlighting type, the circle type, I would invite you to circle the man's nostrils. Now, I have done some CPR training, and I have never been taught to breathe breath into someone's nose. That's a little bit weird. Uh, Maybe God didn't know CPR yet. I don't know, but it is weird. And I want to draw attention because we're going to answer that question here in a second. But I want you to be asking that in your brain. God breathed life into the man's nostril and the man became a living person. So there's a third thing that God informs us in this is I think it's really fascinating that he deviates from what we declared last week. What I mean is not that he deviates into disorder, he deviates into specificity, meaning he didn't speak man into existence, he formed man from his creation. Why why is that? Why is it that he took something in the created order and he shaped it and then he breathed his breath into it? Well, I think he wants to help us understand that we are fully physical and fully spiritual. See, the angels in heaven, they're fully spiritual. There there is nothing physical about them. They cannot operate in our plane. It doesn't mean that they don't influence it. No, they influence it under God's command, but they cannot operate in our plane. And there's the physical. Now, I had a a science teacher. I, I went to a Christian high school. Christian high schools are cool. They really are. 
every, my first class in my freshman year um, was science. And one day this really smoking hot girl, she had a prayer request because we started every day with prayer. See, some of you got caught up in the smoking hot part. <laughs> and I'm talking about prayer, so shame on you. <laughs> She, uh, this girl, she, she was cute. Uh, she's now my wife. That's what makes it cool. Um, but <laughs> she said, hey, I need a prayer request. Uh, my dog is sick and I'm afraid he's going to die. And I was like, oh, what a, what a noble and worthy prayer request. And the teacher at that time, she kind of retorted back. She's like, listen, I'm not praying for your dog. Dogs don't have souls. They don't go to heaven. I'm not praying for your dog. And I was kind of like, <gasps> I thought all dogs went to heaven. <laughs> now, I, I'm not here to, to argue that. I mean, we're about to learn that God made creation for us. God made things for us. Every good thing comes from God. And I think dogs are very good. But what I'm telling you about is there is, a, a, there is an element of truth to what she said is that this dog, Jesus did not come to the earth and sacrifice his life, lay down his life for your dog to go to heaven. He did that for you. And what's crazy about that is it starts here. It starts with the belief that, that God formed you out of the physical and then breathed the spiritual in it. And you're the only thing in the created order that is both fully physical and fully spiritual. So that makes us different. And I need you to understand that we are different. We'll continue in verse eight. It says, then the Lord God planted a garden in the east and there he placed a man that he had made. The Lord God made all sorts of trees grow up from the ground, trees that were beautiful and produced delicious fruit. One of the, one of the things that we breeze over, one of the things that we, we don't wrap our heads around is we think that the Garden of Eden is this holistic place. And what we just learned, and you may have missed it, and I don't want you to miss it, is that there was Eden and it was good. And nothing had sprouted from the ground in Eden. And then God made man. And it says, after he made man, he planted a garden in Eden, in the east. So it's a separate place. There's Eden and then there's the garden that is in Eden. And in Eden, he didn't need the man's help to cultivate. He made the trees go up and produce fruit without his help. And then it says that the man plant or that God planted the man in the garden. It was a sacred space. In the middle of the garden he placed the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed from the land of Eden watering the garden and dividing it into four branches. Again, Sometimes we think, we, we read the Genesis account, we're like, oh, there's one tree, the tree you cannot eat. No, 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 there is a tree of life and it sustained everything and we were invited to partake. In fact, it was intended that it sustained us. And then there was this tree that, that appeals to us all, even now, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And what's crazy is, is that is the same problem that we have Today is the same problem that they had back then. We don't want to just worship God. We want to be God. And so we want to eat of this plane that we don't follow or understand. And, and, and God's saying, hey, that, that's not for you. you. You weren't created to handle that burden. You were created to eat of life. And then it says that there's a river that flowed and all of life is sustained from this river. He then unpacks this river. The first branch was called the Pashan, and it flowed around the entire land of Havilah. There was gold found there. The gold of the land is exceptionally pure. Aromatic resin and onyx stone are also found there. The second branch was the Gihon, and it flowed around the land of Cush. The third was the Tigris and flowed to the east to the Asher. Then the fourth branch is called the Euphrates. And again, many of you are like, wow, God thinks gold is good. Yes. But, but I, I want to remind you, right? Who did he write to? He, he's writing to a bunch of people who probably spent their entire lifetime under the burden of slavery, the yoke of slavery, mining elements for a culture that would adorn their temples and their mansions and their houses. And what God is telling these people, what creator Yahweh is wanting the Israelites to know is, hey, listen, not only is there a river that sustains everything, but this river overflows with pure gold, 
aromatic resin and black onyx. The very things you had to dig for, they just sit there. Why does that matter? It's because this creator is saying, hey, the things that you have to dig out, the things you have to ship in, they've always been here and they're good enough for my riverbeds, not for my house. Whoa, this guy's a little bit different. He goes on. Verse 15 says, then the Lord God placed the man in the garden of Eden to tend and watch over. This is the first time in chapter two that we uh, fall victim to the lack of Hebrew to English translation and the power that comes from it. See, many of us, we read that and we're okay with it, to tend and watch over. But, but you have to understand, if I take that, ex- that same exact phrase and I go, hey, where else in the Bible does it say tend and watch over in Hebrew? We find that exact phrase is used in the entire book of Leviticus to describe what the burden of the Levitical priest was. What does that mean? Well, it would be better translated as to serve and preserve. To serve and preserve. In fact, the same command given to Adam is the same command that Moses gave to the priests, the Levites, when it came to the Holy of Holies. Your job is to serve and preserve. To serve the worship service and preserve its purity. To serve the mission of God and preserve it. What am I saying? I'm saying Adam and Eve were the first priests. That they were the first Levitical people that were supposed to usher people into God's order to serve and preserve creation. Verse 16, but then the Lord God warned him, you may freely eat of the fruit of every tree that is in the garden except the tree of knowledge and good and evil. If you eat of this fruit, you're surely going to die. Now that's interesting because we know, and maybe we should talk about this and spoiler alert, we will. Um, did God lie? Adam didn't die. Well, that, that's the thing about surely you will die is when you live an eternal life and you aren't aware of eternal life and then all of a sudden you became aware of mortality, when did you start dying? See, we're all dying. Some of us are just dying faster than others. What, what God is saying is, is ignorance is bliss. You weren't meant to carry this burden. And if you eat of this fruit... You're gonna have to carry this burden. This burden is heavy. It's the burden of your mortality because you can't eat of what I eat and sustain what I stand because you're not God. You are meant for something else. And then he goes and he looks at Adam after he gives him this instruction and he says in verse 10, then Lord God said, it's not good for man to be alone. I'm gonna make a helper who is just right for him. If you are an underlying type, if you were a highlighter, I would love for you to highlight the word helper. That's a key word. It has a key meaning. And we're gonna unpack it here in a second. The Lord God formed from the ground all of the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And the man chose a name for each one. He gave names to all the livestock and all the birds of the air and the wild animals, but still there was no helper just right for him. Now, I just want you to think about some things. I want you to think about the big horned owl. I want you to think about a platypus. I want you to think about a Tyrannosaurus rex, but only a deer. That would be called a kangaroo. (laughs) Why am I having you think about these things? Because I just want to show you, you can totally tell a man named these things. Like what woman would name a, a, a duck with fur a platypus? Like where did that even enter the picture? But it's interesting that God goes to Adam. He says, hey, there's something not good about this. You're, you're alone. You're not meant to be alone. So he creates all these things that he hopes is going to be enough for the man. And none of them were which is a little bit prophetic. When you search for fulfillment on this side of creation, you will never be fulfilled. So God says, okay, I gotta, I, gotta, I gotta fix this problem. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. While the man slept, the Lord God took one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib and he brought her to the man. At last, the man exclaimed, this This one thing is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken from the man. There's three things that I need you to hear there. Number one, what we just witnessed was the first wedding in all of scripture. In fact, I would say it's probably the first wedding in history. 
I want you to think about a wedding. What, what, what's that moment where the, the who gives this man or this woman to be married today? The, the father walks his daughter down the aisle and, and God, he, he, Adam wakes up and there's God and, and he's got Eve in his arm and he walks her to Adam and he puts her hand in his and he goes, wow. This is not a beast of the field. I mean, he hadn't seen her in the morning yet, but... Come on, come on, sorry. Come on, tension was just right, that was funny, okay. He said, this isn't like anything else. This isn't like the other animals. No, no, he says, this is flesh of my flesh. It's bone of my bone. He goes, I will call her a woman. That's beautiful. Number two, ladies, you need to not be offended when the person who loves you says woman. It is not a derogatory term. It's a, it's a, okay, I'm just reaching there, okay? I, I literally sign all of my cards to my wife, rib. Hey, rib. I just think that's funny, but whatever. Um, but number three is, is not funny. It's actually very serious. Uh, she shall be called woman because she was taken from the man. So, so what we have here is God makes... Adam, a helper. Now, I asked you just a few moments ago to underline the word helper, and I don't want to breeze past that word. Again, this is the second time in this chapter where our English language has failed to grasp the significance of a word. The word used for helper is the word ezer. Why is that important? Well, the word ezer occurs 21 times in the Old Testament. In the two cases, it refers to the first woman in Genesis 2. Three times it refers to the powerful nations Israel called on for help when it was besieged, when it was under attack. In the 16 remaining cases, the word refers to God being our helper. Now, you may not understand the significance of that, but I'm about to tell you because I think if you think that the woman God gave Adam was just merely a side piece or a subordinate or a less than human being, then you have missed the point because the creator and sustainer of all things cannot become less than its creation. And if he himself refers to the term Ezer, the helper of man, then it must be a more significant term than our English language or even our understanding of gender and masculinity can even comprehend. The meaning of Ezer was an idea of a helpful person. In his book, Man and Women, One in Christ, Philip Payne says it this way, I put it on the screen. The noun used here, Ezer, throughout the Old Testament does not suggest helper as in servant, but help as in savior, rescuer, protector, as in God is our Ezer. God is our help. In no other occurrence in the Old Testament does this refer to an inferior person or being, but always to a superior or equal help. Help expresses that women or woman is the help, the strength, the person who rescues or saves the man. What am I saying? Church, I'm saying this. While many devout Christians in this room right now function with the belief that women are subordinate to man, the word Ezra in the original Hebrew overturns that idea. The woman was not created to serve the man, but to serve with the man. Without the woman, the man was only half the story. She was not an afterthought. She was not an optional adjunct to an independent. She was not self-sufficient to the man. God said in Genesis 2 that without her, the man's condition was not good. God's intention in creating the woman was that the man and her together became partners in the serving and preserving of stewarding God's creation. Hello, somebody. We're going to talk more about that on the podcast. So that's another reason you should tune in. It's going to be good. We're going to unpack that one deeper. He goes on, verse 24, the final two verses of the story. He says, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united, united into one. Now, the man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Last time I'm going to do this, if you underline or highlight, I would ask that you underline and highlight, they were both naked and felt no shame. 
Now, now uh, we asked um, the question, okay, th- this is good. We, we literally can call it a day and we'd walk out of here better people. Like, that's good. I mean, that, that's really good. Maybe you've never read with that fresh perspective, uh, but what we didn't answer is the why. I mean, we, we just scratched the surface and, and I, don't, I don't want you to leave with just the surface scratch. I want you to leave with the why being understood in such a way that it compels you to behave differently. And the why is so important here. Now, now I, wanna, I wanna invite you into my processing. I wanna invite you into my brain as tangled of a mess that it is. Um, I, I, as you write, we ask the question, okay, who wrote it? When did they write it? And why did they write it? Well, when informs a lot. So right now, if you were to go to the Google and uh, you would say, hey, when was the Exodus? When were there, there, was there a mass exodus of Jewish people from the country of Egypt? Uh, and when was there this, this period of in-between? And what's crazy is while some people doubt that it ever happened, there's an overwhelming majority of people that believe not only did it happen, but they have narrowed it down to a 200 year window in which it did happen. Now, why is that significant? Well, if you could understand what life was like in the year 200, or I'm sorry, not 200, 1200 to to 1400 BC, there's amazing what other information you can garner. So if we have an understanding that in the Exodus, that's when it happened between 1200 and 400 BC, when, when God's people were pushed out into the wilderness, what's crazy is if you just simply go to Egypt and you ask this simple question, what did worship in Egypt look like? You probably would have a greater understanding of what Moses was trying to teach these Israelites. So I did that, I went there and and one of the coolest things, and it's an archeological marvel, is that the fact that the Egyptian culture is well known throughout all of history for doing the craziest thing, for documenting their worship. In fact, they didn't just document it, they chiseled it into the walls of their temples. In fact, we're still uncovering and still mining through the multitude of hundreds of years of Egyptian history that is still standing today. So that's what I did. I said, hey, uh, what does worship look like in 1200 BC to 1400 BC under that particular Pharaoh? And it would be amazing what you got. Not only did I get answers, but I got literal worship service layouts. They not only describe the temple that they did, what the temple looked like. And so I just wanna unpack because I think if you understand what their worship looked like, maybe we could understand what Moses was trying to teach his people. So the first thing in Egyptian worship is this, that inside there was a temple. Okay, so number seven, there's a temple. There's a place set aside that was sacred and holy. And inside that temple, there was a fashioned shrine, a fashioned idol, that, and this idol was closed off from the rest of the world to signify its significance. Now here's what's crazy, in Egyptian worship, they believed in a multitude of deities. And so they had a temple to each deity. And inside these temples would literally be uh, the the man-made version of a fashioned idol. And, And literally part of their worship, how they would start is the opening of the temple. How they would end is the cleaning of the temple. They would literally sweep the floor so that you could not see footprints. Because they believed that the Egyptian gods not only demanded purity, but perfection. Okay, number two, worship started by opening the sacred space that was closed off from the world and burning ceremonial incense. Well, why why, why would they burn stuff? Well, again, that God demanded perfection. And one of the beliefs in 1200 to 1400 BC in Egyptian culture was that the major medicinal practice was to purify, to to help someone get well, to purify in sickness, to purify in disease was to burn incense. They believed that one was saved through the cleansing of their nose. So they would burn this incense so that the priest would be purified in his worship. Number three, there would be a ceremonial offering in which the people represented by the priest would give something to the God to make them worthy of his presence, worthy of his response. And number four, the image, the idol, was of the deity who was then robed and clothed. 
What I'm saying is, is they literally would take this idol and they would begin to adorn it, not only with, with amazing jewelry, but they would adorn it with robes and opulence because they wanted that deity to know that they thought it was special. Now, now that's cool, but now that you know that, let's run Genesis 2 back through that filter. And I wanna point out some things to you. So let's go in reverse. We're gonna go four, three, two, one. Here's number four, right? They were naked and both felt no shame. What this creator Yahweh is telling us right off the bat is uh, you can't cover or make better his perfect creation. See what the Egyptians tried to robe and adorn, creator Yahweh is saying, no, it's good enough as it is. They were naked as I designed them. And in that uncovering, they felt no shame. Number two, or number three, the creator Yahweh doesn't need something from us, rather he gives us a purpose. See, see not only was the, the Garden of Eden the temple that was set off in a sacred place, not only was it had trees that did not need to be cultivated, but it was sacred because it was the space that God developed. Not only did it have the, the sustenance, the river of life flowing from it, but when the humans were in there, when Adam and Eve were in there, there was nothing that they could give to God. Because creator Yahweh is not a God that needs something from you. It's a creator that wants something for you. See, the creator Yahweh wanted you to participate in his holy order. He wanted you to partner with him in the flourishing of his creation. It gets even weirder. Number two, he, as in God, is the only purifying presence that matters. I ask you to underline the idea, why did God breathe through the nostrils? Is because what he's making very abundantly clear is the purifying presence, the thing that saves someone, the thing that can medicinally heal someone is actually the breath of God and the breath of God alone. He's saying that my presence is what purifies you. Nothing in the created order can make you clean. Only my presence can make you clean. Amen. And number one, which is my personal favorite, the highlight of his worship was who he put in his temple. See, I find it very fascinating that while the Egyptians would have to uh, bend down in the dust and they would have to get water and they would have to fashion clay and then they would fashion in their mind what the image of their God was. We have a creator who got down in the dust and he took some of his own water and he fashioned us in his image. And that's why in Genesis 1, that we learned last week, it says, God created human beings in his image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. What he's saying is, the highlight of my worship is that I fashioned Adam and Eve and I filled them with my presence. And they now are the Imago Dei. That's a big word. What is Imago Dei? It's a Latin word for in him, in his image. They were fashioned in his image. It refers to the symbolic relationship between God and humanity. What he's saying is you can't craft an idol because my presence is not in something else. My presence is in what I made. And the highlight of my worship is what I put in the middle of my temple, which is Adam and Eve. And you're like, wait, what? Well, here's the crazy thing about the Imago Dei, because if we really believe the Imago Dei, there's some things that come with it, and I want to unpack this as we close today. What is the Imago Dei? The Imago Dei is the recognizing that as image bearers of God, that when we believe that we are image bearers of God, it absolutely matters how we treat each other. So there's a couple of beliefs when you say, yes, I am the Imago Dei of God. What you are saying is that we as humans have intrinsic value because of our relationship with God. Notice I did not say we have intrinsic value because of what we can do for God. We have intrinsic value because of our relationship with God. What am I saying? I'm saying that a brother and sister is never the enemy even when they act that way. That on no merit basis is necessary to value human life. That every life, in spite of what it is capable of, is worth something because it is an image bearer of the creator. 
And no life is too marred or muddied to not be worth value in the eyes of the creator. Humans are sacred and exist to represent God on earth. Wait, what? If we are the image bearers of the creator, then guess what, church? You might be the only Jesus someone ever sees. You might be the only Jesus your neighbor ever sees. In fact, you might even be the only Jesus your coworker ever sees. And you might even be the only Jesus your son or daughter sees or your granddaughter. And you know what the problem is? Some of you are awful at being the only Jesus someone sees. And I know many of you are like, yeah, there's some evil people out there. No, I'm talking in this room right now. There are some people in this room that are awful representatives of our creator. The way that we talk to each other, the way that we dismiss each other, the way that we don't encourage each other are all indicators of how we value each other. And you don't have to go far. Just go to lunch after church today. And ask yourself, how am I to treat this person who can do nothing for me? How many of us are gonna go to lunch today and spend more time justifying to ourselves why we shouldn't be generous to someone or why they don't deserve our tip or why their service wasn't on par than actually loving someone in spite of what they could ever do for you. I don't, don't take me literally. If you think this is about tipping, you missed the point. There, there's gonna be someone that leaves this parking lot that is so frustrated because someone thinks that they could drive. They've even been told by the state they could drive, but clearly they can't drive and you're gonna flip them off. It happens all the week, all the time. This is specifically why we don't do bumper stickers here because I don't want anyone to know you'd go here. <laughs> Literally, it's, we're gonna walk out of this room talking about being an image bear and we're gonna get angry at someone in a parking lot enough to curse them. Humans are sacred and exist to represent God on earth and we're awful at it. Humans are made to reflect God's nature by doing what he does. I don't know what you, what is the quantity of your schedule? What's the quantity of your conversations? What's the quantity of your financial investments? What's the quantity of your spending? What's the quantity of, of what you talk about? What's the quantity of your search history on the internet? Does it testify to who you follow? Does it testify to the nature of God or would you be ashamed if it was publicly displayed behind me right now? Again, see, we say that we're image bearers of God, but we don't act like it. Humans share God's character and nature. Humans have the responsibility to serve and preserve God's creation. Let me take all of those and just give you a real succinct Statement to help you walk out of here a better human being. Notice I didn't say follower of Christ, just, just a better human being. Are you ready? The heart of your worship is in how you live and treat others. Now, I, listen, there's some people on this side of the room that your mind is like, oh my gosh, pastor. And then there's a smaller amount of you over here going, duh. And I need everyone who's over here to get over here. Because a thousand years ago, there was this crazy guy named Jesus and he said it better than I ever could. When he was asked by the teacher of the law, what's the most important commandment, what's the important law? He looked at them without blinking an eye, without pausing, without even having to think about it. He says, I want you to love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And the second is just like it, it's just important. I want you to love your neighbor as you love yourself. See, the mind-blowing aha moment that I want you to understand is for 2,000 years, for 8,000 years, from the dawn of time, God is not giving a new message. He's been trying to get you to understand his message from the beginning. That you, human being, are the apple of his eye. You are the imago day of the creator. And your behavior only testifies to your worship. You can't, you can't craft an idol good enough to, to, to appease because God crafted you. And he says, how you live either appeases me or it doesn't. God has always been after our heart. 
The message that Moses is trying to impart to these Israelites is, you are the image of God. And we're gonna be a different people by how we talk to each other, how we treat each other, how we encourage one another, how we live, because we serve a God who wants the world to know him by how we live. That's pretty crazy. That's pretty crazy. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you need some time to process that. Well, you're lucky. I'm gonna give you some time to process that. I'm gonna give you time to go, all right, Lord. Woo, how am I doing at reflecting you today? Who do I have to say sorry to? What do I have to repent? Because I came in here and I testified how the battle belongs to you. You're worthy. My heart of worship is you, God. But I can't even talk to the person I said I love with respect. I can't even treat my kids with kindness. I can't even respect my neighbor. I don't know what it is, but how are you doing at being an image bearer of creator Yahweh? I'd invite you to ask yourself that question. And I promise the world will become a better place if you just start to respond accordingly. And here's the thing, the church would probably grow faster than it ever has in history, which is also a pretty cool thing, isn't it? The, it's kind of like when Jesus said, I, I've come to bring the kingdom and it's a forceful advancing kingdom and forceful men lay hold of it. Forceful men and women lay hold of it. People who are willing to look at themselves in the mirror and reflect less of themselves and more of him. Those are the people that lay hold of a forcefully advancing kingdom. Would you stand as we process today? Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your conviction. Thank you for what you wanted the Israelites to know. God, thank you that you're still desiring us for us to know today that how we live is the truth of our worship. How we talk, how we walk, how we act, what we say when no one's looking, what we do when no one's looking. It is more than just what we come into a church and declare. It is the true source of our worship. May we worship you better. May we worship you more worthy as sons and daughters of the creator God. May we worship you like the God that you are, one who deserves our affection and our attention because we are image bearers of you. So God, we give you this time for you to speak, to convict, to remind, and to encourage, just as you did for the Israelites. Please do for us. We pray these things in your name. Amen, amen. Come on, would you sing with us? Sing praise. Sing praise to the great I am. We join all heaven singing. Worthy is the Lamb forever and ever. Amen. Praise to the great I am. We join all heaven singing. Worthy is the Lamb forever and ever. Amen. We sing, sing praise to the great I am.
sorry. That's our job, and I pray that you would walk worthy of your calling today. I think, pray that you would walk worthy of your calling out of here. I think, I pray that you would walk worthy as the Imago Day of our Creator, because how you act, especially outside of these four walls, is far more important than how you act inside these walls. All right? Listen, I have one other challenge for you. Uh, you may not know this, but 70% of the world lives on the sustenance that this bag of food provides. In fact, this bag right here is a meal of six from 70 plus percent of the world. Why am I telling you this? Not only do I want you to join us, but this week I want you to go buy one of these. This is $2 for a meal of six. I want you to buy this. And one night this week, I want you to have family dinner and I want you to eat what most of the world eats. And I want you to thank God from the depth of your heart and maybe even your stomach, how blessed you are and how much of a person of abundance you are just by living in this country. And I pray that you come prayed up and ready to pour out because we're gonna pray the blood of Jesus on every one of these meals and everywhere that they go this Saturday. And I hope that you'll join us because it's gonna be a memorable day. I love you, church. Have an amazing rest of your Sunday.